Throughout World War II, the best of the best, the top guns of their day, were the aces of every nation. The aces, men who could claim five or more planes to their credit, rose to fame through their amazing exploits in aerial combat. By war's end, only 3% of all fighter pilots could claim ace status. Those 3% accounted for almost 50% of all the air-to-air -air victories scored between 1939 and 1945. How did they achieve such success? Clearly, an ace was a breed apart, a man who combined extraordinary flying skill with courage, keen eyesight, and savvy tactics. Those who lived through their combat experiences were usually the most calculating of all. The men who balanced risk-taking with a cool, professional understanding of their aircraft and the capabilities of the enemies. The best aces chose their tactics based on those two factors, combined with the position they found themselves in at the start of a fight. Fighter tactics in World War II underwent a radical transformation by the time VE Day brought the fighting to a close. As much as air fighting changed, however, the basic elements remained a constant. In fact, all the basic tactical foundations had long since been laid in World War I. But it took time for those lessons to be relearned once Hitler's rampage in Europe began 20 years later. During World War I, air combat tactics evolved into two basic elements in the fighting over the Western Front. The first was the traditional swirling, turning dogfight that you see in all the World War I type air combat movies. But the Germans developed a real specialized tactic uh, by 1918 to preserve their small fighter force on the Western Front. This was the hit and run tactic. They were able to dive into opposing formations, hit them, and then run away as fast as they could by high speed dives. Well, during the 1930s, both of these elements of air-to-air -air combat were really lost uh, as tacticians and theorists concluded that dogfighting was a thing of the past because of the high speeds that new fighter aircraft were capable of achieving. The RAF was probably the most heavily influenced by that argument. Instead of focusing on air-to-air -air combat between fighters, it developed a wide array of rigid tactics designed to mass the firepower of a fighter formation onto bombers. Fighters in the RAF were considered interceptors, not air superiority weapons. The mass attack tactics developed by the RAF during the interwar period proved to be an utter catastrophe during the initial stages of the Second World War. The main reason for this was the fact that when flying in these tight formations, only the squadron leader or the flight leader would actually be looking around for enemy aircraft. Everybody else was so busy flying wing on uh, the other aircraft in the formation that they didn't have the opportunity to be looking for enemy aircraft. Consequently, they were constantly surprised and uh, aircraft were lost that probably wouldn't have been lost had they been flying in looser formations. The other issue was the fact that uh, taking uh, these unwieldy, large, cumbersome formations and trying to maneuver them in a very, very fast dogfighting environment uh, proved to be incompatible with the realities of modern air warfare. If the RAF entered the war with deliberate and rigid tactics, the Luftwaffe took the opposite approach. The war in Spain taught the Luftwaffe to heed the lessons of World War I. They developed loose formations of four planes each called a swarm, with two plane elements called rotes. They were flexible and allowed the pilots enough room so they could be looking around for enemy aircraft. As the British came up their learning curve, they gradually abandoned their pre-war tactics in favor of modified German formations. Originally, RAF squadrons flew three plane VICs or Vs where the leader flew with two wingmen tucked in tight behind him. By early 1941, the British had developed a six-plane formation that was much looser and effective. It was a variation on this formation that the RAF taught to newly formed American squadrons that joined the fight against the Luftwaffe in 1942. Basically, the British formation that we used was, was a, a box formation. Uh, a, f a leader, a wingman behind him and slightly off to the side, uh, element leader, and 
his wingman off a little bit to the side, uh, almost a box. From the RAF tactics that the U.S. Army Air Force inherited in North Africa and also in the early days in England, the pilots, the fighter pilots, the American fighter pilots developed a new formation that they called the Finger Four. And it's very similar to the German uh, Schwarm, but imagine uh, four planes on the end of each finger and each fingertip or fingernail representing the aircraft. The leader would be right here, the flight leader. The, his wingman is this guy right here. The element leader is here and the element leader's wingman is in trail behind the rest of the formation back here. And the point of this formation was to fly as loose as possible while still being able to provide mutual support. And this way they could all be looking around for enemy aircraft and protect each other at the same time. As formation styles evolved, so did the fighter pilot's knowledge of how best to employ his aircraft against the enemy. In training before the war, dogfighting had always been considered something of a one-on-one -on -one affair. Little effort was made in such encounters for a fighter formation to work as a team. Again, it was the Germans who rediscovered their roots. In Spain, they learned the distinctions between dogfighting styles, hit and run versus a turning fight. A light, agile fighter was found to be best for a turning battle while faster aircraft with better climbing and diving characteristics proved to be the best hit-and-run style weapons. The Germans developed the best early war hit-and-run fighter in the Messerschmitt 109. The 109 was capable of amazing vertical maneuvers and uh, performance. And as a result, they could dive down on British formations, hit them, make a pass, and climb away with their, uh, with their energy that they had accumulated in the dive, and engage and disengage the British at will, and the early American pilots as well. And this sort of attack caused a lot of losses amongst Allied aircraft and, and air crew during the early days and early months of the war. The only thing that the British and the American pilots in 1940, 41, 42 could do was try to break away from these diving attacks and turn. And while that was a, a fine defensive maneuver, it made them entirely reactive. They could not really retain the initiative or capture the initiative away from this amazing energy fighter. Any time you got into a jam, attacked by 109, and they were usually above us, so they'd have the initiative initially. Uh, Any time you were attacked by 109, about the only thing you could do to, to keep from getting hit was to get into a tight turn, which he couldn't keep with you. And if, he, if you could persuade him to stick with you, you could eventually get around, work into position on his tail. The Germans could never turn with you. A 109 had a much heavier wing loading, 34 pounds, 32 pounds versus the Spitfire's Hurricane 25. So a German wouldn't be fool enough to try and get on a tight turn with you. You'd nail him. You'd just turn inside him and shoot him. They knew that. Occasionally, overzealous German pilots would commit a fatal error and attempt to turn fight Allied fighters. Those pilots did not live long. I spotted a bunch of 109s came came down from above us, and uh, heading down toward the toward the targets. Well, I turned my flight up into them, and tried to to divert them, drive them off, which was kind of silly because there were about six six or eight 109s, and we were four P40s at that point. At any rate, we got into a big big hassle going round and round, and. Um, I wound up with three of them on my tail, taking turns and making passes at me. Uh, and as, as I had mentioned earlier, when they'd get within what I estimated was firing range, why I'd get into a, go into a turn and manage to uh, divert them that way to the point where they couldn't pull enough lead to uh, hit me. And one of them made the mistake of trying to turn with me, and in two turns I got around behind him and killed him. As the war progressed and newer American designs entered the fighting over Europe, the Germans saw the advantages they enjoyed with the ME-109 and FW-190 erode. From about mid-1943 on, German pilot quality really began to decline. And as it declined, 
allied pilot quality increased as there was the more breathing room to train the pilots more effectively and more thoroughly before they went into combat. And it was that fact combined with the new aircraft that the Allies were just beginning to deploy that could outclass the 190 and the, and the Messerschmitt 109 that gave the Allies the edge they needed in the skies over Europe. The P-47 Thunderbolt was the first of the new breed. At altitude, nothing could beat a Thunderbolt if flown by a skilled pilot. Though normally considered a hit-and-run or energy fighter due to its terrific diving abilities, in the hands of a skilled pilot, the P-47D and M models could tackle any Luftwaffe fighter in any type of dogfight. With a fighter capable of both styles of air combat, the tactical situation usually dictated how the fight would develop. Whoever had altitude advantage generally initiated the fight and would attempt to keep the engagement vertical using hit-and-run strategies. At low altitudes, energy fighters were at a distinct disadvantage. If caught low and slow, they could be chewed up by turn fights where they would have no escape. Fortunately, the P-47 in skilled hands proved to be a more than capable all-around fighter, even in a low-altitude turning fight. We were on the deck, working on the deck, and I think we could outfly him on the deck. He couldn't, he couldn't get away from me. I could turn in and keep right with him, and so he, I just had him going and going, and he finally decided it was better to get out than to get shot down. While the P-47 proved to be an excellent fighter aircraft, early P-38 pilots who flew against the Luftwaffe in late 1942 and 43 found themselves at a real disadvantage. Initially, many P-38 squadrons attempted to engage in turn fights with the German 109s and 190s, a disastrous mistake. Since the 109s and 190s were as fast or faster as early P-38s, the American pilots usually could not outrun their Luftwaffe counterparts unless they started a fight with an altitude advantage. Even the mid-war variants of the P-38, including the F and G models, had a particularly hard time in Europe in the escort role. Tied to the bombers, the Lightning pilots seemed to always find themselves in a disadvantageous tactical situation. A German plane could cut off their attack any time. All they had to do was dive. A P-38, this was a, a bad maneuver because if we went into a dive and followed them, why uh, we got into compressibility, at first, we couldn't, we couldn't pull it out of there. Um, compressibility is, is a high-speed buffet, and um, you just, it's, it's, it's dangerous. They were up there hiding in the sun, and they'd roll over and come down at us. And, and um, for a while there, we thought the Germans were after us instead of the bombers. We didn't. We couldn't outturn them, and we couldn't dive with them. It was their show there for quite a bit. We didn't get as many of them, I guess, as they got of us. We had quite a few losses. After some painful lessons, the P-38 units learned to at least hold their own against the Luftwaffe through 1943. When you see them coming, you, you turn they, they didn't like the front end of a, of a P-38. And they had respect for us. You see, they didn't know what we could do. Um, they, they had to learn just like we did, how, how, how well we were going to perform against them. By the end of 1944, however, the P-38L reached units in the European theater and gave the Americans a revolutionary model of the Lightning. With its hydraulic boost controls, dive brakes to inhibit compressibility, and powerful Allison engines, the L model allowed the pilots to employ tactics that weren't available to them before. The original P-38 was kind of stiff. You had to really put effort. One pound here was one pound out there. 
But after they put those hydraulic boosters on it, one pound here was 16 out there. And boy, we could outroll Spitfires or P-51s or any of the rest of them with either on boosters. And so the quicker you can establish your turn and pull back on the stick, means the tighter turn you can make, see? And we could outturn anybody, and, and then it would turn right, being so stable, whenever a single engine plane gets down to about 91, 92 miles an hour, if you're turning to the right, and it stalls, it'll flip back over this way, out of control. P-38, you could turn it right down forever, 72 miles an hour at full power, and never stall out. And getting that turn established was the main thing. Up until we got the dive flaps, Every time we get in a fight with the Germans up at altitude, we could outturn them. We could really outturn them. But the minute we got inside of them, they'd just turn over and go straight for the ground, 26,000 feet or wherever you were, see. And if we chased them, we got out of control. And the P-38 wanted to tuck back under like that. And the more you pulled on it, the more it would tuck under. It was out of control. So they had, we had to have something that would keep it from accelerating past that speed. So they, invented this dive flap that was run by electric motor and it opened like that it took about one second to open and close you know and the minute that guy in front of you pulled that split ass like that you just pop those dive flaps and you just get right behind him and boy were they surprised after we got those because they'd pull out at the bottom 26,000 feet not very fast to run very far to run at 450 miles an hour see and when they pulled out at the bottom there's a p38 right on their tail you know and that, that was their big surprise. That, that really, dive flaps, die, we called them dive brakes, but they were dive flaps is what they were. They were really great. We could outturn them, we could outclimb them, we could outdive them, we could outlast them, and we could outgun them. This late war version of the P-38 gave the American pilots the confidence needed to engage the Luftwaffe in nearly every conceivable tactical situation, knowing that in a pinch, they could fight their way out. Jim Byers recalls one fight that started in a most unusual way, with the Americans engaging from below. They were above us to start with. And we were in a hole in the overcast, you know, we looked up and there they were about 2,500 feet above us. And they were getting all queued up in an echelon. So I just took my flight through, right through the middle of them. And they scattered. And then we started picking them off, but none of them would fly out of that hole, see. They, they were, had to be inexperienced. We shot all 14 of them down, 11 of us. But our 11 guys uh, accounted for 700, over 700 missions. See, they were pretty well experienced by then, you know, see. God, there ain't no sense of letting them get the first shot, you know. And if you sit and do nothing, you get hurt. But if you make a mistake, you can change that, see. If you do something and make a mistake, you can change it. But if you just sit there and do nothing, you can't change anything. In other situations, the P-38 could be one of the deadliest hit-and-run fighters of the war, especially if the Lightnings began a fight with altitude advantage. And we looked off to the east, a whole bunch of enemy 109s, about 20 of them, were attacking four P-47s. Coming down, boy, just like rain down out of the sky. So we flew over there and got in the fight, and we shot down eight of them. All that happens fast, you know. I, you know, you're scared, but you're not panicked. You know, see, that's that's the difference right there. Yeah, and uh, anybody that says they aren't scared, they're useless because anybody that is any good at all gets scared. In 1944, when the 354th Fighter Group introduced the P-51B into Northern Europe. The tide of the air war turned decisively against the Luftwaffe. At last, the Allies possessed a long-range air superiority fighter whose capabilities matched or exceeded every enemy fighter. While the P-47's major weakness was its slow rate of climb, the Mustang climbed like a homesick angel and dived with the best the Luftwaffe had to offer. With no major weaknesses, the P-51 became the best all-around air superiority fighter of the war at any altitude. That caught the Germans flat-footed there for a while. They really gave them a bad time. Because the 51s, he catch the German air force in the air, and they dropped those tanks, and then they cut them to pieces because the 
the 51 could out turn the Messerschmitts. So they made out real well there. By war's end, the nature of the air war had evolved into a brutal struggle for positional advantage. From the early days when the Germans were able to dominate the RAF with their sleek 109s and their deadly hit-and-run tactics, newer Allied aircraft arrived in time to change the fundamental nature of the air war. While retaining their edge in turn fights, Allied pilots enjoyed unparalleled flexibility with the late generation of fighters and could fight the Germans in vertical hit-and-run style and win. Such flexibility spelled doom for the Luftwaffe's fighter force by 1944. While different tactics could help offset the advantages an enemy may have in aircraft quality or quantity, there were some basic elements to air combat that always remained a constant. Mastering them took time, something that fighter pilots in World War II didn't always have. During World War II, American pilots used to say, fly five and stay alive. And what that meant was, if you made five missions, if you flew five missions and you were still alive, your chances of survival through your entire tour just went up exponentially. The reason for this was something that later was called situational awareness. SA was basically the ability to process all the information going on around a pilot in the midst of an air-to-air -air engagement. And developing the the sense of situational awareness needed for survival in air combat took time. If a pilot could fly five missions, he'd have the experience needed to really understand and process the things that he saw. But before that point, he had no concept of what was going on around him. He, frequently, pilots never even saw aircraft around them in an air-to-air -air engagement. And even more seriously, they rarely saw the aircraft that shot them down. Uh, as a result, it was the inexperienced pilots that made up the brunt of losses through the entire Second World War. Dogfights are funny things. They, uh, they're huge. They might go all over the sky. You, you lose track of your own people. Hopefully your wingman stays with you. Uh, if he doesn't, then you're in trouble because you not only have to watch what you're doing, you have to watch behind you. Uh, people who don't check six are in deep trouble. If they won't be victor, they'll be victim. Sighting the enemy has remained the single most important element to winning any air-to-air -air engagement. Once the enemy had been sighted, keeping them in sight was always critical to winning the battle. Another fighter-pilot proverb of the day ran, lose sight, lose the fight. Without knowing what the enemy was attempting next, a fighter pilot could not select the maneuver needed to counter it. Again, that was why so many inexperienced pilots went down. They simply could not see or process all the information unfolding around them. Sometimes, if a pilot lost sight of the friendly aircraft in his flight or squadron, they could be almost as hazardous as the enemies in close-range turn fights. One of my very first sightings of an enemy aircraft uh, was a 109 who crossed in front of me. I uh, um, turned and got headed towards him in a steep bank left, and uh, all of a sudden uh, he started coming apart, and I hadn't fired my guns yet, and it was Glenn Eagleston coming in from the other side had hit him. Glenn used to uh, tell me all the time, I owe you one. We almost, we almost were air scoop to air scoop when, we, when he finally hit him. If a fighter pilot could stay alive long enough to learn some of the key lessons in air combat survival, he could become a very valuable asset to his squadron. During the war, to be a successful fighter pilot in air-to-air -air combat, you needed a couple of basic ingredients. The first was eyesight. A uh, successful fighter pilot had good eyesight and could spot enemy aircraft at, at long ranges. The second was the ability to uh, fly his aircraft to the edge of its performance envelope. Basically, he needed to be a good pilot. And kind of as a corollary to that, 
he needed to understand his aircraft as thoroughly as possible so he could get the most out of it. And that really came down to a number of hours that that particular pilot had flown in the fighter type he was taking into combat. Lastly, he needed to have a thorough understanding of the tactics that would maximize his aircraft's potential and capabilities in air-to-air -air combat, while at the same time negating some of the advantages the enemy aircraft possessed over his own aircraft. Air-to-air -air gunnery was and still is a true art form that only a select few ever really master. Dick Bong, America's ace of aces, spent his first months in combat unable to hit anything except from practically dead astern. Later, after undergoing extensive gunnery training in the States, he returned to combat and became an incredible aerial marksman, hitting targets from virtually any deflection. Deflection shooting was the ability to take out a target from, from different angles relative to that particular target's uh, direction. So firing from directly astern on, a, on an enemy plane was called a zero de degree deflection shot, while shooting from a uh, 45 degree angle from behind was called a 45 degree deflection shot. The most difficult shot was the 90 degree deflection shot, where the shooting plane was perpendicular to the target aircraft. That required the most amount of lead and the most amount of calculations in the pilot's head to actually hit the target. Deflection shooting was actually an art form. Uh, it was very difficult to do, and there were very few pilots who were really good enough to hit a target from anywhere except dead astern. So those that were able to do it really had very high scores. Uh, Rene Fonk was probably one of the most famous deflection shooters in aviation history. He was a World War I French ace with uh, over 70 kills to his credit. Uh, during World War II, some of the great deflection shooters were uh, Hans Joachim Marseille, who was a German pilot who was renowned for his ability to bring down very rugged aircraft like P-40s with seven or eight shots. He was that good of a marksman. For the Americans, probably one of the best deflection shooters was Tommy McGuire, who had 38 kills and was the second-ranking American ace in World War II. Through much of the war, Americans relied on fixed reflector gun sights. At first, the standard K-9 gun sight was used. Later in the war, however, the United States developed a computer gun sight known as the K-14. With the help of a gyro, it would compute the lead required to hit an aerial target. We had a K-14 site that was a gyro site, and you put the pip on the plane, and if you were in too tight of a turn, though, you better have your stationary site on, too. And that happened to me, and I was pulling in a real tight turn, and the thing was gone. Just dumped. It would dump. You pull a gyro too fast, it'll dump. Then you got to shut it off and get it going again. And I had, if I'd had my needle or ring and dot, I'd probably be got him, but I, nothing I could do. So uh, you had to be careful when you're in a real tight turn with that gyro. But it was a good, it was a big improvement. It was the rare individual indeed who could master all these complicated and demanding elements of air combat and survive long enough to get good at them. Of those who did, only a select few became true hunters, the aces. Their workplace was the vast reaches of the sky over Europe. Their job, a grim repetition of killing and survival. Losses among the top aces were always high. Throughout aviation history, aces have always been among the most aggressive pilots in the air, but some have been more aggressive than others. And these, these types of aces led brilliant, if short, careers in air-to-air -air combat. They were the reckless of the reckless. They were the ones who would wade into any fight, no matter what the situation, no matter how heavily outnumbered, and they would fight it out. And these guys scored incredible uh, victories uh, in a very short sp span of time, but generally they fell victim to their own recklessness in the end and died uh, at the hands of their own mistakes in air-to-air -air battle. To survive in air combat took courage, skill, and lots of luck. To become a hunter instead of just a target took a healthy combination of experience, eyesight, and the proper tactics. 
It took all sides involved in the air war time to relearn the basic air combat lessons that emerged from World War I. But when they did, a whole host of tactical innovations transformed the air war in Europe. Bad tactics could get even the best of the best killed. Good tactics could offset nearly any advantage the enemy brought to the table, ensuring both survival and success. <laughs> 